Life Church today. We're glad you decided to join us today on a great, wonderful weekend, and, and you chose to be here. I've got two or three announcements for you I want to share with you. Uh, first of all, many has been announced in the last few weeks, but you know in just a few weeks we're sending a group of people to Carlinville, Illinois for a National Youth Conference. We're sending like 30 or 40, we're sending a bunch of people out there, and that's a great thing. However, we've got to raise about $3,000 in two or three weeks. But we've got some great ideas on how to do that. This weekend, we're going to have a softball tournament. And you've heard us say for a long time how great Life Church softball is, right? <laughs> some of you have seen us play, haven't you? <laughs> But we're trying to, we're going to host a softball tournament this weekend, and, and uh, if you would like to help, like to play, we've got a sign-up sheet out there. If you'd like to play and you've not been asked, let us know. Sign up out there, and we'll get you out there somewhere on the team. Also, if you want to come and support it, if you don't want to play, we've got room for workers. If, if you want to donate some time and helping and things like that, we've got a place out there also to sign up to bring things like pop and, and, and water and, and things like that. Uh, so stop by the resource center on your way out the door after all. See what you can do to help us raise money and send all these kids to our to our youth camp, okay? Uh, also, uh, to go along with that, uh, we're asking if you've got any stuff that you just like to clean out your garage, your closets, anything like that. Uh, donate your stuff for a garage sale. Uh, it's going to be done kind of going along with the same thing again trying to uh, raise money for that. So if you'd like to donate some time even and, and help us out on that, we encourage you to do that. So stop by and see us at the Resource Center after the service day or if you just want to sponsor someone on their way, 65 bucks is all it's going to take. For you to just write out a check and say, man, we just want to sponsor a kid to go to our National Youth Conference. You can write out a check for that. And also, we want you to pray for us. First of all, the funds will come through. And then when these kids go, there will be some genuine life change occurred in the lives of, of these young people, okay? Uh, also, when you come in, I hope that you got a connection card. It looks a lot like this. If you're new with us today here at Life Church, you've got some change in information or things like that. Please fill these out. Let us know if you've got some prayer requests and things that's going on in your life you want our prayer group to pray for. Fill this thing out. Uh, put it in the bucket later on in the service. And we want to pray about that. We want to know about what's going on in your life. Also, during this time, is the time that we take to meet and greet your friends and your neighbors. Let them know that you're glad today that they ch uh, chose to join us here at Dead Life Church, okay? God bless you.
worship you. God, I thank you for each and every person here. God, you know what they brought in here with them this morning, God. You know the struggles that are on their mind, the worry that they brought, the burdens that they have. God, I ask that today that you will just speak through Pastor James. God, that you will speak through the music that we sing this morning. God, that you will just ease our minds and our hearts and just let us come to you and lay those things down at your feet this morning. God, thank you for always being there when we need you. We love you.
and uh, uh, just some things that, that, that we've got going on. Of course, we talked about our camps and things like that for our, for our teams and things like that. And again, we expect great things to happen in people's lives because I really believe that when people come together in one accord, we come together for one goal, one common purpose. God moves in, in times like that. Well, when we think about all those things, if, if we just need to cover those things in prayer. Well, I, for a couple of weeks before we kind of get into our main summer theme, and i got to tell you, as we start this summer, uh, we're, we're going to get into a series in, in just a couple of weeks uh, called H20. Now, I want you to know that, that I borrowed that title from a fellow by the name of Kyle Allen, and we've uh, studied some of his stuff on a Wednesday night service with him down in the basement. But I, just, I just love the title H20. And during this time of the year, especially since I run the baseball program, i got to tell you, throughout this past week, we've seen some... H2O. I, I don't understand how we've made it, but we didn't get rained out at all this week and all that rain that was coming down. We played sometimes in the rain. Some of the people sat in the cars, but we got through it. But you know, before baseball is over this summer, we're going to be looking for rain. It's going to get dry and it's going to get to the point before this summer is over where we've got plenty of water now. Now, sometimes we have to sponge off fields before this summer baseball season over. We're going to have to start watering the field. We're going to have to start looking for water. And I, that, that's what we're going to look at a little bit later on. Starting in a couple of weeks, we're going to start a, a series called H20. But as we, as we gear up for that, we think about a couple of things throughout this next couple of weeks. What we're going to look at is, is a little bit about circles. Now... As we think about circles, i, I, I got to be honest with you. When we started this morning, I, I went back into the kids' area, and I was looking for some things that were circles. i got to be honest, I was looking for a hula hoop. And uh, I, I was going to bring that hula hoop up here, and I was going to show you how good of a hula hooper, if that's the word, that I could be. But we're probably pretty, pretty safe in saying that it could have been a disaster. If I'd have tried to show you how good of a hula hooper that I was, because I've not hula hooped since I was probably in junior high. So it's probably a good thing I couldn't find that, but a hula hoop is made out of a circle. And when we think about circles, you think about wedding bands and things like that, they just kind of continue on, they go on and on. If you was to right where you're sitting right now, begin to kind of make a, a, a big circle around you, let's say about a 16 foot diameter circle. Who would be in your circle? Now, sometimes in circles in our life, in circles of influence, sometimes people come into our circle and sometimes people leave our circle. Sometimes they're in for just a short time and then they move on out. In our baseball season, uh, Tyson and I, as we get out, we, we, we get the fields ready. The standard size circle around the pitching rubber uh, for girls softball is about 16 feet. So I was thinking, in a 16 feet circle, who all enters that circle from time to time? Well, it's not just the pitcher, but from time to time, the catcher might come out and have a conference with the pitcher, and they step inside the circle. Sometimes an umpire might come out and might have a few things to say, and they enter into that circle. Sometimes a coach might come out if a pitcher is having a difficult time. They enter into that circle. What we want to look at for just a couple of weeks now is an idea of a circle of influence. Did you know the people that come into your circle, they come into your influence. And sometimes we influence people in a positive way. Sometimes we influence people in a negative way. So if we begin to think this, this next couple of weeks about circles of influence, that's the idea that I, want to, I just want to plan in your mind. As we begin to look into what we, what we want to share with you this morning, we see that Jesus is standing at the very top of a mountain. Here he was, the Son of God, the, the promised Messiah whose coming had been prophesied for, for centuries. Christ would be God in the flesh. He would be Emmanuel. He would be God with us. And now as we see Jesus standing on this mountain, we can see that he's about to, to ascend back to heaven after the resurrection, after the crucifixion, the resurrection, and spending about 40 days on the earth uh, kind of showing himself and teaching his disciples some of the last things. We seem about to, to ascend back to heaven. And Jesus has a closing conversation with his disciples who are standing there on the Mount of Olives, and, and he's talking to them, and this is what he says. I believe it's in, 
in verse 8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There's one part in there that I want you to kind of focus your mind on. Is if you had a highlighter in your mind, I want you to highlight the, the word that says, You shall be my witnesses. Now, a witness bears testimony. A witness bears the truth. It, it might be a, a better paraphrase to say like this. You will have a power more than your own, a power from the Holy Spirit to help you connect people to the life of Jesus. Did you know as, as, as people within this church... You have a power to connect other people, not just necessarily to life church, because that's not necessarily what we're looking for us to do. Sure, we would love to have a house full of people, but what we want more than filling this house is bringing people into a connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we think about circles. We think about our influence. We think about the people that, that walk into our circle of life. Now, there's, there's different types of group that do that. And, and what I want you to kind of get your mind wrapped around this morning is as we think about circles of influence, I want you to picture a table. It could be your kitchen table. It could be a table over at McDonald's or Guacamole's or, or wherever else that you like to eat. If you like to go out of town and eat, it could be a table somewhere else. But I want you to picture that table. And I want you to picture who it is that you might set across that table and they might be at your table. They might be in your circle of influence. I want you to look across that table and begin to think about it for just a minute who that you might see. There's a lot of people, I think, that enter into our circle of influence. Now, it doesn't matter what your spot would be in the, in the, in the birth order. It doesn't matter where you live in the community. It doesn't matter uh, about your position in, in, in the marketplace or the job market and things like that. We all have people in our circle of influence. And it's not by accident that these people are there. God has placed these people in your circle. And within that circle, He has called you and I to be a witness that we talked about a while ago inside of this circle. People that step into your circle, you have been mandated, you've been called by God to be an influence to the people in that circle. So again, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to discuss how, how that we can be a, a positive influence in maybe a couple of the most obvious circles of influence that we might have. And then after this two-week mini Mini series. We're going to we're going to jump right into the idea of H two O, and it's a series that we would hope that we would introduce people to to, to to Jesus and to the to the living water that satisfies. A lot of times, even people within the church are not really satisfied. Even people within the church sometimes are still looking for other things that would satisfy. But Jesus tells us, not just once, but numerous times in His Word, that He offers living water. A water that, that if we drink of that water, our thirst will be quenched. Our souls will be satisfied. We've got to. We've got to take that water. We've got to drink that living water. And this is what H2O is going to be about. A water that really, truly satisfies. But today as we look into the scripture and, and we want to think about those that's in our closest circle, the people in this circle, the people that we look across the table from maybe daily, the people that we eat with on a regular basis, chances are that the, some of the people within that circle might be our family. It may be some of our closest friends. But did you know that probably this two groups of people are probably the hardest groups of people that we encounter for us to share our faith with is, is our family and even our closest of friends. 
What do you suppose that is? Why is it hardest for us to share our faith and to share what God is doing for us with those who's the closest to us? I think really probably the most obvious answer is, is they know us. Someone said it like this one time, they know us warts and all. They know our failures, they know our mistakes, they know everything that there is to know about us because they are the ones closest to us. They see us when we, when we mess up. They see us when we fail. Sometimes it's easier to go halfway around the world and share our faith with a stranger than it is people that's the closest to us. Our past may be hidden from those that we don't know very well. But to those closest to us, they see the skeletons in our closets. Another problem, I think it is, that we, that we encounter when it comes to sharing our faith with, with those closest to us is fear. It's fear of rejection. Now, if, if you get into an airplane or you get on, into, a, into a group of people and there's a, a, a number of people around and they're mostly strangers and, and you begin to share your faith with them, you begin to try to witness to them and they reject you, and you're probably never going to see them again anyway, right? So, so that's not really that big of a deal if they reject you if they're strangers. But we fear rejection from those who are the closest If strangers ridicule our beliefs, it really does hurt that badly. When someone close to us rejects what we stand for, what we what we love so much, it's kind of tough. If you have your Bibles, like to read along with me, and it obviously, like always, is going to be up on the screen. We're going to we're going to open up the Book of John, chapter one. We're going to take up our reading at a, at a point just after Jesus has come down to the Jordan River to be to be baptized by John. And, and at this particular time, Jesus hasn't gathered any followers to him. He's just beginning his ministry. He's just beginning to, 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 to make himself public. So Jesus has come down to, to John the Baptist to be baptized in the River Jordan. And, and, and after that takes place, we begin to encounter some scripture where Jesus begins to to influence some other people's lives. When we begin our reading in about verse 35, John 1, 35, the following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and he declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want, he asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And we read another place where Peter being interpreted means a rock. When you stop and you begin to look and try to try to back up a little bit and just kind of see this whole picture of what's going on, we see that that, that, that Andrew and, and one other guy, many people think that it was that it was John, the beloved, uh, one of the other disciples. We don't know that for sure, but but we see Andrew especially as one of John the Baptist's disciples. He was one that, that had spent some time with John. He was one that had been pointed toward a time when, when the true Messiah would come. Well, the day comes that, that the Jesus comes down uh, the pathway, and, and John the Baptist looks at Jesus, and he says, There's the one. There's the Messiah. There's the one that we've been looking for. And Andrew leaves John the Baptist. And he follows Jesus. Now after these events begin to take place, 
after Andrew has, has come face to face and met Jesus and, and he himself begins to accept and believe who Jesus is, Andrew doesn't make the mistake that many of us do, because usually when it comes to our family, we wait. We stew, we procrastinate, we try to put things off, we, we worry about how they're going to respond. But as soon as Andrew really encounters who Jesus really is, as soon as he got it worked out in his own heart and his own mind that this truly is the one that we've been looking for, Andrew makes a beeline. And he goes and looks for his brother. He goes and he begins to find his family, his brother, the one in life that was the closest to him. Now, we don't need to be an expert. We don't need to be a, a, a doctor of theology or anything like that. We just need to begin to win. A new Christian one time asked uh, an old-time preacher by the name of D.L. Moody, uh, how long does a person have to be a Christian before he can start telling other people about Jesus? And Moody looked at him and told him, how long does a candle have to burn before it starts lighting up a room? Immediately. When Christ does something in our life, we need to immediately begin to tell other people what Christ is doing. Because when we, when we stew about it, when we procrastinate, when we put these things off, that fire begins to burn a little lower. We begin to worry about what people, their response might be. So we see this picture of Andrew, as soon as he, as soon as he comes to, to accept who Jesus really is, he makes this beeline to where Peter is, and he begins to tell him, we have found the one that we've been waiting for, the one that we've been searching for, the one that we've been looking for. He says, we have found the Messiah, the teacher. I've got this drill, this, this black dagger drill. And it's the kind of drill that you have the power pack and it's got the battery on the end. You keep that battery. Uh, when it runs low, you put it on the charger and it charges it back up and it gives it full power. But you know what happens to that battery when you, when you leave it on the charger and you leave it plugged in and you never use that battery? It's just as damaging on that battery to be on the charger never being used as it is to be on the drill itself being used and then being recharged. Sometimes that battery can be worn out because of underuse quicker than it can be burned out because of, of overuse. The charge doesn't last as long when we don't use those battery packs. So Andrew, he doesn't wait, he doesn't stew, he doesn't procrastinate, he gets the road, he goes and he finds Peter, he begins to tell them, we found this one that we're looking for. But it's not just with our family, sometimes it's hard to, to share our faith. Sometimes it's, it's other people, and, and we can read on down, and we can find another scenario uh, where, where a man, uh, uh, after encountering Jesus, he, he finds a close friend. Like your, you know, like your family, your, your closest of friends know you better than, than anyone else. It would seem fitting that, that when you found something new and exciting that you'd want to share your faith with them. That's where a fellow by the name of Philip enters into the picture. Verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come. And follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. So these guys probably knew each other. But Philip went to look for Nathaniel. And he told him, we have found the very person that Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, explained Nathaniel. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself. i got to tell you, I love that phrase. We find it on a few different occasions in the Scripture, but, but I like how, how Philip lays it out before Nathaniel. Nathaniel has doubts right off the bat because this guy is from Nazareth of all places. 
Can anything good come out of a bird like that? Philip doesn't try to defend Nazareth. He doesn't try to defend anything else. I love the phrase that Philip throws out. He just says, come and see. Come and see for yourself if this man is not the one that we've been looking for. Come and see and make up your mind for yourself. Now again, as we look at this, it, it, it's possible that that Philip could have been that other guy that was with Andrew the day before. It's possible that he could have been. But again, we know that, that Philip somehow or another, he, he had this connection with Jesus. He had somebody who on his mind. Somebody in his circle of influence. Somebody he cared about greater than he that he wanted to, to share with them what Jesus had done for him in his life as he met him. Sometimes when it comes to talking to those that are the closest to us, whether it be family, whether it be our closest friends, our example becomes even more important. If we live a life of, of worry, of, of, of immorality, of, of anger, of, of things like this, of... of uh, of, of, of alcohol and, and, and just different things like this is going, to, is going to hinder your influence with people who are trying to win to Christ. Chances are your example is going to be a barrier to those that's closest to you accepting the gospel of Christ. Why would they want what you claim to have if you live a life filled with, with immorality and anger and, and all these things like this that, 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 that the scriptures speak so plainly about, how would they want what you claim to have? So what we do when we live a life like this, we hinder our influence. We, we damage our circle. Now there's a, there's a scripture in the New Testament. And, and again, we, we think about uh, this idea of, of our examples. And we we win those people that, that walk in and out of our circle of influence through our through our consistent example of through our consistency, through our through our being Christ-like. Through that consistent example. So when we try to reach out to those closest to us. Our example becomes very important. And we can see that as we, we turn for just a minute over to, to the book of 1 Peter again. Remember, we, we talked about the rock that, that Andrew comes and he finds, and, and Peter goes on and he preaches this great sermon at Pentecost, and thousands of people are saved. Well, Peter has an idea how that, how that we can win those people that are closest to us. He, he gives some helpful advice and and so many times when we read the scripture, we try to pick and choose the things out of this scripture that is almost the negatives. But as we read this, I want you to look at the positives out of this scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses just 1 and 2 is what we're going to read. In the same way, you wives, <laughs> you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Now, when you hung up on that, but I want you to hear what it's really saying. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, who's it talking about? The husbands. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, talking to the wives, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. We get so caught up on this subservancy, this, all this stuff like that, instead of understanding that if we live a, a pure and a godly life, that that's the greatest influence of all that we can ever share, whether it be wives with husbands, husbands with wives, parents with children, children with husbands, with, 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 with parents. In our circle of influence, living that consistent life is the greatest influence at all of winning those that we love so dearly, those in our closest circle, of winning them to the Lord. When they look at you, when they observe you, if you're consistent in your love and your devotion to Christ, 
That's the greatest tool in your toolbox that you could ever have to win those to Christ. I think what Peter's really saying, and again, he's saying this to the wise, but I think it's across the board. Share the gospel by how you live more than by what you say. And again, I believe that sometimes words are necessary, words are important, but it's about that consistent behavior in your lives, that consistent example of your relationship with Christ. If you want to be able to look across the table at your family and your close friends, then you need to be the same person regardless of who you're with. You need to be the same. You need to be consistent. When you come to church, you should be the same as when you go to work. That don't mean if you tell dirty jokes at work, I sure don't want you to come to church telling dirty jokes. I think what that means, if you don't tell dirty jokes at church, you don't tell them at work. We need to be consistent. Example. Another thing that I think we can see out of these passages of scriptures uh, concerning Andrew and Peter and, and, uh, and Philip and, and Nathaniel, I think that we can see, especially in the life of, of Andrew and Philip, we can see their genuine excitement. That when these guys, when they really truly met Jesus, they were on fire. They were excited. They could not wait to share what they had found out, what they had learned, what experience had taken place in their own lives. They couldn't wait to get to those people that was in their closest circle and tell them. They, they were on fire. They, they were genuinely excited. Now sometimes we can muster up excitement. Sometimes we can put on an excited face. Sometimes we can act excited when we're not really you see, sometimes in the church, we, we put on masks. Sometimes in the church, we only see people with that mask on, that this happy, that this, this, this idea that there's nothing going wrong in our life. But these guys had encountered the, the, the living Christ. And once Andrew had met Peter, he couldn't, or once Andrew had met Jesus, he couldn't wait to tell Peter. You realize that as Andrew wouldn't have had that influence in Peter's life, there wouldn't have been this great sermon at Pentecost where thousands of people would be saved. You realize that, 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 if, that if Peter would have seen the excitement in Andrew's life, there might have been no change in Peter's life. But Andrew couldn't wait to get to Peter after he met Jesus. He didn't care about how he might be perceived. He didn't care that Peter might say, Andrew, we've been looking for years for something that will satisfy us, and we've never found it yet. Andrew didn't worry about how he might be perceived. He didn't worry about political correctness. He didn't worry about the social word of the day and the social standing of the day. He just went and told him, he just dove right in. We have found the Messiah. It was excitement rather than fear that, that moved him. You see, that's what happens when something new radically impacts your life. When something exciting impacts you, let's get away from the church and spiritual things for a minute. When something impacts you, when something comes into your life that you're happy about and you're excited about, you can't wait to tell others. So many times when, when, when God is doing something in your life, oh, we're afraid of how it might be perceived. And if we're not careful, a relationship with Christ becomes some decision that might have been just made in, in, in our ancient past. But the excitement that long since wore off. These guys were genuinely excited. 
And pretty soon, because of this excitement, the gospel message begins to, it begins to, it begins to flow, it begins to spread. When we don't have that excitement, that genuine excitement, that old, old story becomes an old, old story. It must be tempered with that genuine excitement. Sometimes we try to we try to justify our apathy. Well, I just don't want to force my beliefs on somebody else. We might say, well, my family knows how I stand. My family knows where to find me if they have any questions. But Andrew's so excited. He, he can't wait to find Peter. He didn't say, maybe tomorrow. He didn't say, well, maybe at Thanksgiving I'll share my beliefs. Maybe next year on the family trip. He went immediately. And my experience has been the longer we wait, the less apt we are to share the experience in our life. So we see a consistent example. We see a genuine excitement. We also can see a, a creative effort going on on these guys' parts. We can also look into the story of another disciple. Now, first of all, before we get into the, the idea of, of Levi, of Matthew, let me say this, when you think about creativity, God is a creative God. I mean, my goodness, you don't have to look very far to see God is creative. God created the heavens and the earth, the mountains, the sea, and all these things that we can see with our very own eyes. You see, God made that. God is a creative God. We look at the story of, of, a, of a disciple, a future disciple by the name of Levi, who's also called Matthew, the writer of, of the first book of the New Testament. We can find that back in Matthew chapter 5, I believe it's verse 13. Now, Matthew's this guy that, and I would say nobody liked him. He's a tax collector. And that day, tax collectors, they kind of skimmed off the top and maybe even off the bottom. He was having issues. But he says in Matthew, Jesus says these things in, in Matthew 5, 13. I'm going to read it through 16 if, if, if I can. No wonder that didn't make sense. 5, uh, 13 uh, through uh, 16. This is Jesus speaking. <coughs> You're the salt of the earth. What good is salt that's lost its flavor? Can you make it salt again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now when we think about this, we, we think about the salt of the earth idea, and we, we think about the light of the world that's to follow. We see here where, where, where salt isn't any good if it's lost its flavor, if it's lost its influence. Salt adds pizzazz to, to what is normally bland and common. I gotta tell you, most of my family, when they get a plate of fries, they get anything. The first thing they look for is is salt, or in Tyson's case, catch it. But most of the family, they, they take this salt and, and, and where some people just kind of dabble them on there, and some of them will take that salt and just kind of give this number. A lot of salt. Salt adds flavor. Sometimes when Tyson was younger and he would make popcorn and things like that and, and he knew that when he made popcorn and I could smell it, I wanted to get a handful of, and just eat it and, and he got to where he would salt that stuff so much I didn't like it because it was too salty. He liked it salty. He could eat it like that but then I didn't want none of it. It was too much. But when, when, when our food doesn't have that savor, that, that flavor, when salt has lost this appeal to it, it's no good. You see, Jesus expects us in our circles of influence to be like this salt, to be like this light of the world. Our creativity is an expression that Christ is in our life. In Luke chapter 5, I don't think I'd turn this in if you guys have, but in Luke 5, uh, I think it's 28 and 29. This is after Christ has come and he's called Levi or Matthew to follow him. He says, follow me and be my disciple. 
Levi gets up, leaves everything, and follows him. This is what it says in verse 29. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as a guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. Now think about that for just a minute. Matthew, Levi, holds this banquet and invites these other people that's just like him to come in and, and have this banquet, this supper. And who's going to turn away a feast of food like this? He's creative and get these other people there so that Jesus can, can reach out to them as well. Now, it may have angered some of the religious folks, but Matthew was creative in getting his people into the presence of Jesus, getting the people in his circle of influence into the very presence of Jesus. So he, he throws a party. He has all of his buddies that's not been exposed to Christ's teaching. So that they could have a chance to interact. So we see these creative efforts. We see this sincere appeal. This small talk and, and all these things like this. But it's very difficult for us many times to make this sincere appeal to get people to make a decision about whether or not they're going to follow Christ or not. So many times we, we get people in the doors of the church, and that's great, that's super. Because at least then they're exposed to the teachings of Jesus. But many times we get people in the doors of the church and they just kind of become church people instead of Christ followers. In most churches around this nation, most churches have people within the doors of the church that's just church people and not Christ followers. But what we see here, what Andrew and Philip's idea was, was not just to get Nathaniel and Peter to be church people, but get them to be followers of Christ. And for them to do that, they had to, to issue a sincere appeal, a sincere uh, uh, question before them. Andrew says, we have found the Messiah, and you can almost hear him also say, so Peter, what are you going to do about that? And then it will be up to Peter. When Philip was saying this, it will be up to Nathaniel. When Philip would offer the invitation, well, come and see. Now it's back to Nathaniel's ball. It's a sincere appeal. Here's Jesus. Here's what he's done for me. Here's what he can do for you. And then it's up to you. We pray, we encourage, we do all these things. But it's a sincere appeal. So when we think about this idea of the circle of influence, we, we, we think about these things about like our consistent example. We, we think about our creative efforts. We, we, we think about this genuine excitement, this thing that's going on in our life. And let me tell you this, if there's not something genuinely exciting going on in your life, there may come a time that you need to renew that, that commitment. Now, sometimes we just go through dry areas, but sometimes we just need to come and we just need to renew our commitment to the Lord. It's not just us had to do that. We see from time to time the disciples had to do that. But if, if we're going to have this, this large circle of influence for those that are closest to us, our, our families, our closest friends, and we don't have these things, this this consistent example. If we don't have this genuine excitement, if we don't have some creative efforts on how to get them exposed to Christ's teachings, remember there's eternity at hand. Eternity is a stake. We're going to look next week, I think, about the, the lady that was at the well. Jesus comes to the well and he begins to talk to her about these things. And, and, and one thing that he tells her in this is, is he offers this living water, a, a water that, that satisfies, a water that quenches thirst. He would teach her. He would ask for an appeal. He would, he would ask for a decision. Now the plan in all this is not to impose our spiritual beliefs on anybody. But it's built relationship, it's to encourage, it's, it's to invest in people's lives. As we begin to gear up toward our H2O idea, I would encourage you, I would ask you to begin to look into yourself and see if you possess these things and these qualities that I think it takes to, 
the ministry moments within our circle of influence, that excitement, that, that creativity, that consistency of example. See where you're at. And if those things are not present in your life, I guess my appeal to you is what are you going to do about it? Because if you don't have that, the people that you love the most, the people that you care about the most, they're not going to want what you have. Where do we go? Well, the lady came to Jesus at the well. And she walked away satisfied. We look for satisfaction many times everywhere else. But the very thing of Jesus at the foot of the cross. But it's no secret today that that's the only place that can be found. Jesus said himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He says, I'm living water, I'm the bread of life. He says, I'm the door into the sheepfold. He is, he is, he is. He's the way. He's the one. If you're looking for satisfaction that you've not found, it can only be found through Jesus Christ. It can't necessarily be found at Life Church. It can't necessarily be found at the Assembly of God, Cross Point, or any other church. It's at the feet of Jesus Christ. But God has placed you in my circle of influence. He's placed me in your circle of influence. And folks, for us to enlarge our circle, we've got to be consistent. We've got to be creative. And we need to be genuinely excited about who Jesus is and about what he's doing. And when people see that, they will be curious about what's going on in your life. They'll be curious. And your circle increases. Where do you stand today? If I had a title for what we wanted to leave with, it just seemed to be, guess who's coming to dinner? Your family and your closest friends for sure. Where do you stand today? Has your hands are you still salty? Or have you lost your flavor? If you've lost your flavor, what are you going to do to get it back? Sometimes it just takes coming around an altar and just crying out together. Sometimes it just takes just getting away from everything for just a little while and just coming, coming before God. Lord, here I am. I'm struggling right now, but I, I'm looking for that that's missing. And I know that you have the answer. What you're going to do. What are you going to do? Let's pray again. Father, this morning as we come before you today, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you today to know that we all have this, this, this circle of influence in our life. Some of our circles may be bigger than others. But there are always people that walk in and out of, of our circle of influence, no matter how large or how small that it might be. And, and God, I just pray that the people that's, that's within our realm of influence, God, you would, you would get us to the point in our lives where we need to be, that those people that walk into that circle would see something appealing in our lives. Much like Andrew. And Lord, Andrew's circle is, is still looming large today. Lord, much like Philip's influence for the family. God, I pray that our influence would be genuine. That as people walk into that circle, God, they can see a person that's on fire for you. Lord, when they walk into that circle and they see folks that's not on fire, and they're just going through the motions. Why would anybody want that? So God's day throughout this building, God, I pray. God, I pray that you would renew a fire. God, that you would renew a zeal across this building, Father. As we begin to look into this, this idea of living water through H2O, God, I pray that your spirit would move. God, that we would be able and willing to get out of our box, get out of our own circle, God, and, and go and, and insert ourselves into other people's circle. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to pick somebody, a family, a friend, a uh, somebody, God, that 
we can just bring before you, Lord, bring into this place that your influence may be filled. Lord, I pray that today, as, as from the very beginning, you tell us in your word in Acts 1 8 that we shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon us. God, I pray, Lord, that today you would empower us with your Holy Spirit, God, to be bold, to be witnesses, God, in this place. And, and, and wherever we might be, God, we might be a true, genuine influence in people's lives. We will not have lost our, our flavor. We would be salty. Lord, again, today we love you. God, we pray that for everyone in this building, God, today, Lord, we pray that we'd be challenged. That we'd be encouraged, God, to, to just allow you use us in this way to bring others to you. Not to wait, not to put it off till tomorrow, but to do today what needs to be done today. Just like Andrew, just like Philip. Throughout this building, God, they move. Speak to your people, the church. Speak to the Christians. Speak to those that's not came to faith yet. Just speak to these people. And I pray that your spirit, God, you just be so very close to them. And we sing praise to you. Lord, we love you. We give this service and the results into your hand. In Jesus' name. If you have a need today, you need to pray around an altar. The invitation is for you. If you've lost your zeal, if, if you've grown cold, the invitation is for you. If you just want God to, 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 to just fill you through and through, if you just want the, the, the Spirit of God to just be genuine and real in your life, an excitement, a boldness, this invitation is for you. If you need direction on who it is that, that you're going to enter into their circle this week as we begin to look into the next series, this invitation is for you. You see, this invitation is for everybody that, that yearns and thirsts for the touch of Jesus in your life. Is that you? The invitation is for you. Stand with me while we, while we worship. If you have a need, if you need to come around the altar.
easy. Let's give him all the Awesome, awesome service. Um, if we can have our ushers uh, come forward right now, we are going to take this time just to give back to God what is already his through our tithes and offerings. Um, and if you bow your head, I'd like to pray over that. God, thank you so much for this day, Father. Just the opportunity to come and worship you. God, I thank you for the music that was sang this morning and played, God, and for the message that was brought. God, I ask that all of it just pleased you. God, I ask that you will bless this offering and our tithe. Father, um, just bless that church so that we can be a blessing to our community. Amen. Amen. 